Uh, can you can you hear me now? In the back. Okay. Good. So um, so this is what the, uh, what we we're going to you know the, to be uh, looking at in terms of you know what what a real system actually uh, has uh, available to the GPUs today. So let's start with historical time. Okay. And uh, this is what we call the classical historical PC architecture. This is the PC architecture uh, that, uh, you know, when that was your age, this is exactly the architecture that we use, okay? And um, uh, so we have two bridges uh, in the system called North Bridge and South Bridge. And these bridges are actually chips that are produced mostly by Intel and AMD, you know, what, uh, for, for their, uh, you know, uh, for the PC manufacturers. They sell you the GPU. They also sell you these what they call the chipsets that man manage all the traffic going in, you know, going from the I/O devices into the system. So uh, these are the uh, so these two are uh, usually called the core uh, core logic chipset, and the, the North Bridge is very fast. North North Bridge is usually the, the bridge that connects three components: the CPU, the DRAM, and then the video the video interface. So uh, you know when these you know the kind of the uh, display screens start to become popular, um, you know, there needs to be a way for the uh, the video device to receive the video signal. So that it has to be, uh, and the display memory is actually in the DRAM. So uh, there needs to be a very fast high bit rate access between the video controller and the, the DRAM. So the CPU will will be accessing data. Uh, in and out of the DRAM, and also your, uh, the display device, which is the video driver, okay, driving the CRT and so on, they would also come to the memory uh, and, and uh, fetch the, the buffer data and you know, just uh, keep updating the, the video screen. NVIDIA started as a lowly display car manufacturer, okay? So, so this was the very early days of GPUs. And then uh, we started to have 2D graphics, 3D graphics, and so on. Then uh, you know the display became more window driven and uh, more kind of uh, graphics driven. So uh, that's the rise of Nvidia in the past almost 30 years. Okay, 25 years in fact. Uh, I think uh, last year was the 25th anniversary of Nvidia. And uh, so uh, the, these three components. Uh, remain to be the kind of the most important, uh, you know, uh, cl closely coupled components in the system. And then uh, the previous NVIDIA cards are connected to the what we call the advanced graphics port, AGP port uh, bus, into the North Bridge, and they can uh, can uh, access the memory uh, at up to two gigabytes per second. And this is a, you know, this is amazing bandwidth. Back then, and this kind of you know not so much a good bandwidth today. And I'm going to show you you know well, where we are today. The South Bridge is uh, you know is really a constant sort of a concentrator for slower I/O devices. Your your uh, your, your uh, mouse, your keyboards, your hard drives, your uh, floppy disk drives. <laughs> I don't know how many of you even have seen that. So those things all feed into this South Bridge. And the, the, these things cannot be uh, producing data fast enough. You know, I don't know how fast you you type, but I certain don't uh, certainly don't type at uh, two gigabyte per second. Okay, and then if you can, can type two gigabyte per second, come 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 to me, and I'll I'll make sure I book you a show at the Tonight Show or something. I'll I'll take you as my my prodigy, and then you know, we'll, we'll have a good time. So uh, so these keyboards and mouse and so on produce information occasionally, so they, they all get concentrated. Okay, they go con using the, the the South Bridge to become a uh, a, a con aggregated traffic into the North Bridge, and then you can you know uh, place the I/O data into the memory through some of the things that you learned in 391. Okay, so that's kind of you know the classical uh, PC architecture. Um, about 20, uh, a little bit over 20 years ago, uh, the industry decided, uh, you know, decided that the PC world need to have higher speed, you know, um, uh, I/O architecture. So, uh, you know, they came and uh, you know, put together. Uh, they came together and, and defined the PCI uh, bus specification. 
And this was a uh, you know the, was the origin of the PCI cards that uh, you see at the back of your PC boxes. Okay, so uh, you know the, essentially on the on the motherboard uh, there will be you know up to eight slots, and then these slots are exposed at the back of your PC uh, you know the uh, ch chassis or PC boxes, and then you can you can see that uh, out of these slots there's some connectors. That are visible at the, the, the output. So the you know that's where the uh, you know the mouse and keyboard and some of these you know video connectors and all these things come out. And um, so uh, the original specification of the PCI bus operates at 33 megahertz. Okay, that that was high bandwidth and the high high clock frequency, 33 megahertz, and 32 bit wide. Each each uh, you know each bit uh, you know each bit Lane is 32 megahertz. You have 32 bit, uh, 32 of them. So multiply them together, you get 132 megabyte per second. Essentially, you multiply 33 by 32, and that gives you the number of bits. And then you divide by eight, you get 132 megabyte per second peak transfer rate. That was a you know astounding uh, you know number uh, when I was you know uh, uh, a little bit older than you. Okay. And later, um, you know, the industry came together and uh, uh, you know defined the 66 uh, megahertz version, and they widened the bus to 64 bits, you know, the, uh, you know adding more uh, lines. And then uh, now you can transfer 528 megabyte per second, almost uh, more than half gigabytes, okay, uh, gig, uh, gigabyte per second, and that was amazing. So, but the interesting part. This is actually something that uh, you know you, uh, you, most people don't really fully appreciate from history. The upstream bandwidth remains slow for a device such as you know what they they are about half of the bandwidth and that's about 256 megabyte per second. The concept is this: the concept is most of the processing and most of the useful information generation is done by the CPU. Okay, so. You know, as far as the I/O devices are concerned, the I/O devices don't generate a lot of you know uh, a, 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 a lot of kind of useful stuff. So the only time that the, uh, you need to have you know uh, good bandwidth is from is when CPU demands some kind of disk traffic or some you know disk access and get information. Whereas you know what the the CPU will generate useful information, therefore. The information going downstream to the I/O devices, the bandwidth is usually higher. Okay, and uh, uh, you know if you uh, if you look at the early uh, internet, it's exactly the same concept. So, uh, you know the useful information will be coming from the outside world, and um, uh, so the downstream bandwidth is usually a lot higher than the upstream bandwidth for a long, long time, until the users start to to back up their data, the users start to upload videos and so on. That's when the internet start to have symmetric bandwidth. So the, you know, even up to about 15 years ago, uh, for the DSL lines, the, the downstream bandwidth is usually much much higher than the upstream bandwidth. Even today, some of the you know, the, in some, except for some of the uh, more modern connections, we still have similar uh, you know similar kind of you know the discrepancies. So, so this tells you that the CPU is really the king of the world, okay, in the PC world, and everything else is kind of the lowly devices that uh, you know that can you know receive the blessings from the CPU with all the data coming down, but they cannot you know put the data into the world as quickly as the CPU are, is allowed to. Right. So, so this is what we call the hierarchical. Uh, you know, sort of the uh, the power center. The CPU is the power center of these architectures. So the uh, and then the PCI bus is a set is a arbitrated bus. Okay. So if anyone needs to access, you know, need to send data <laughs> to the CPU, uh, then it needs to arbitrate for that bus. And the bus there's a bus arbitration and there's a bus grant. And once you get granted with the bus, uh, you know, uh, uh, control, then you send the data through. So uh, you know, so if you have a, a device 
that needs to send a large amount of data, and you, uh, you need to break it up. Otherwise, you could uh, you know, block the, you know, the, the mouse clicks or the keyboard. So you know, the, occasionally, the users may not be able to, you know, to actually see that uh, the, key, the key clicks and the, uh, the mouse clicks actually got something. So you will think that the, the system is dead. In, you know, well, in, you, even today, uh, when you use uh, laptops, occasionally these things freeze because you know, well, the, it's not because the bus anymore. But the, when the software does not respond, you will think that the, you know, this, uh, the system is dead. But in the old days, even the hardware can lock up like that. So this brings us to a kind of an um, a interesting topic for 408, but it will become an essential topic for 508. PCI is, um, you know, is a memory map I.O. Uh, architecture. So um, you know, we all know that uh, these I.O. devices have I.O. registers, buffers, OK? And um, so uh, they all have these kind of you know, data. Uh, when the data come in, uh, they, they have, we have these buffers that would uh, you know, uh, take, take uh, the sort of uh, store this data and then forward that into the CPU uh, DRAMs. So uh, all these registers and buffers can be mapped into the CPU's physical address space as memory locations. And this allows the I.O. drivers running on the CPU. Remember, all these drivers are running on the CPU, managing these I.O. devices. And these uh, device drivers can access the registers and so on using the traditional C data structure, because they, are, they can be treated as memory. So you, uh, the typical way to do this is to, to provide a pointer. You know, there's an API function that provides a pointer to the driver. And the pointer points to the beginning location of the several memory locations that reflect, uh, that reflect the registers and buffers in the, uh, in the device memory. So the device driver can just go and say, I want to access this struct. And each member of the struct, field of the struct, is maybe a control register or a buffer location. And so the driver can just you know, uh, access that information. So this memory map I.O. Turns out that uh, this became the foundation of uh, you know, the CUDA memory management <laughs> in the, uh, for GPU compute devices. And we still uh, are limited somewhat by the memory map I.O. semantics. So when the, C when the CPU uh, you know, uh, does a memory access, but this is going back to the 391 uh, material. You know, believe it or not, 391 is very useful. Okay? And still, even though you know, many of you suffer than complain, but 391 is extremely useful. So uh, when a CPU executes a device driver code, the device driver would uh, do a memory access through a, using a memory variable, you know, and, uh, using a pointer. And the pointer <coughs> gener eventually generates a virtual address. The virtual address will be translated by the virtual memory uh, manager. And uh, the, from the uh, translation, uh, you know, the, uh, the address, uh, uh, the translation table, and then um, it will generate the physical address, right? The physical address, if that physical address is mapped into uh, one of these I/O devices, the bridge, okay, the north bridge, is going to take that physical address and say, "Ha, huh, that address is not in the DRAM, okay? The address goes down to the I/O devices." And the I.O. devices will be, you know, what the, all the I.O. devices with memory mapped I.O. will be listening on that, uh, on that uh, you know, uh, bus, on the PCI bus. And the, when the address comes down, the device that has the address in that range will just grab it and say, OK, I'm serving that. OK, so this is the protocol that, uh, that uh, we use. And even as today, when the operating system talk about uh, you know, any of these you know, memory locations, uh, map, memory map uh, locations, they still will say the CPU bridge, even though the bridge does not really, really exist anymore. But they would say the CPU bridge will direct these accesses into the I.O. devices. And so that's really the, uh, the model here. So uh, after a while, um, the industry came out and uh, came back and said, we, need, we really begin to need to have even higher um, bandwidth I.O. because we have networks now. Okay? The internet and the cluster computing 
all these things are beginning to require much higher uh, bandwidth into and out of the, the computing systems. So Intel led the, uh, led the development of PCIe, PCI Express. And um, uh, so this, this, uh, you know, the, the interconnect is no longer a shared bus. So when you plug these things, you know, these uh, boards into the PCIe slots, they are no longer plugged into a arbitrated shared bus. They, each slot actually has a dedicated link to a PCI, PCIe switch. This is the reason why the width you know, the, the connection width of these PCIe boards and, and uh, you know, devices are limited. Some of them are only X1, some of them are X4, some of them are X16, some of them are X32, but you have a limited number of uh, devices in the system that can have wide connection. Because every line from each device has a dedicated connector into the PCIe switch, and you're limited by pins. So whenever someone builds a system, they cannot have arbitrary number of PCIe boards with 32 in, uh, you know, lanes, because these, that will require 32 physical you know, uh, links into these switch boards, uh, switch chips, and these chips just don't have enough pins to accommodate that. And, but after, because of your, uh, they're willing to settle for this limitation, now all the PCIe devices are directly connected to these PCIe switches, and they no longer have an arbitration. They no longer need to be blocked by other devices because of the arbitration. So now uh, the people can begin to implement what we call the quality of service, meaning that uh, you, know, you can actually have, let's say, a video stream coming through uh, the PCIe switch, but then because it's packet switched, so even though you're transferring all these packets, you can slip in the, uh, the mouse clicks. You can slip in the, key, the keyboards, and the switch just kind of you know, the, uh, switch between these packets so that uh, you, know, you will not have unacceptable delays to some of your, uh, you know, your messages. So if you look at the PC, a, a real PC today, even the laptops that you're using, it, there's already a very sophisticated network <coughs> You know, uh, in that uh, in that uh, uh, computer. Okay, so it's it's uh, quite sophisticated. So so let's you will be hearing uh, you know comments about PCIe Gen One, Gen Two, Gen Three, Gen Four, or in Gen Three mostly today. Okay, and what are these things? Um, within each PCIe generation. Um, you have the speed of each link is fixed. Okay, there's a fixed bit rate for each, uh, you know, for each PCIe uh, 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 PCIe lane. However, if we need to have more bandwidth within within the same generation, what we do is we make the connection wider. Okay, so. You know what? Well, you start. You have x1, x2, x4, x8, x16, x32, and so on. So by making these the connection wider, you can have more bandwidth within the same generation. And then every so many years, the industry will come out with the next generation, and the goal is to double the bit rate from one generation to the next generation. Okay. So the, you know. So uh, we 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 now at uh, we're now at uh, Gen three. So Gen 3 is our current generation. And um, uh, so each lane, uh, each link consists of one or more lanes. So what is a lane? A lane is actually four wires. Okay. You, you actually, for every lane, it's a communication channel at the bit, you know, at the bit level. So it's one bit com being communicated, but it can be communicating in both ways. So there are four wires, and each pair of wires is a differential pair that you can send you know, a sequence of bits through. And one pair will go in one direction, and one pair will go the other direction. That's why, if you, when you uh, look at the PCIe lane, the, uh, the bandwidth is symmetric. 
upboard, up link and down link bandwidth are equal because there are four wires, two pairs, and these two pairs are identical. It just one goes in one direction, one goes the other direction. So you can think about each lane as a two-lane highway, okay? In our highway system, it goes in both directions, okay? This is perhaps one of the most confusing aspects of PCIe because most of the manufacturers will tell you the bandwidth of the PCIe link in terms of the sum of the uplink and downlink. They will add up the bandwidth in both directions and say this is the bandwidth of the, in, of the connection. But in reality, you will only be able to get half of that bandwidth when you go in, in each direction. So when you send data from CPU to GPU or you send data from G, uh, GPU to CPU, oftentimes you end up seeing only half of the bandwidth that the manufacturer had advertised because they added the bandwidth in both directions, okay, when they advertised the system. So this is why, you know, I always provide this slide for, you know, for this 408 class so that you know the reality of, you know, the, uh, when you uh, copy from uh, CUDA main copy from, CB, uh, from the host to device and from the device to host. So this is how it, uh, how, how it uh, re really looks like. So each lane is one bit wide, four wires, two wires per can transmit up to eight gigabit per second in one direction, okay? So when I look at an X1 Gen 3 connection, I would, uh, this, bit of, this uh, pair of wires can transmit up to eight gigabit per second, okay, in this direction. And then you can transfer up to eight gigabit per second in the other direction. Obviously, if you have a Gen 2 system, it will be four in one direction and four in the other direction, okay? And Gen 1 will be what? Two and two, right? Okay? So each link can combine one, two, four, eight, and so on, uh, you know, of these uh, lengths, right? So they're called X1, X2. And, uh, uh, but the interesting part is you will never get, quite get eight gigabit per second transmission uh, in these lengths. You will get something close. You'll get something probably about 7.8, 7.9 gigabit per second in each of these lengths. And uh, the reason is um, you're actually going to, uh, you need to have a, you know, you need to sacrifice about two bits every 130 bits in your transmission, okay? So, you know, you, you, when, when you transmit every 130 bits, you get about 128 bits of useful data out of that transmission. So that's why you will never be able to measure uh, anything that is quite 8 bit, uh, gigabit per second for the length. And this has to do with what we call the 128 slash 130 encoding. And in Gen 2, it was worse. It's, 100, uh, it's 8 bit out of every 10 bit encoding. So this is something that uh, I think an engineering student should know, uh, especially someone can, uh, come, who comes out of the electrical and computer engineering department uh, in ECE. And you know, I think in our great university, anyone from computer science should know about this. So uh, the foundation is this. Um, you know, when we design these very high-speed links, okay, these are physical wires, and they have transmitters on one side, you know, the, uh, and then receiver on the other side, okay. And uh, these things are extremely high-speed. So when you design this, you need to be very careful about the what we call the uh, the DC balance, because we, if we have too much current, uh, you know, going in one direction and then uh, you know not in the other direction, then uh, the, the too too much current uh, uh, when we transmit these uh, you know, bits and zero and one essentially have this differential pair, right? The, the zero and one are uh, reflected as differential pair. If we transmit too many of these zeros, we will have the differential will always go in one direction, and then you have these, you know, the higher charge going in that direction, 
or always once you have higher charge in, in one side of the lane than the other, ultimately you start to cause trouble. So we need to have some, uh, something called DC balance. That is, in the long run, you know, you know, uh, when you look at so many bits in, time, uh, in the time frame that is being transferred, the ones and zeros in, that, in the contents that are transferred in, uh, by those uh, a pair of wires need to be somewhat balanced. You need to have about the same number of ones and zeros so that you don't build up that charge in the receiver and uh, cause problems. And the, so the difference between uh, of ones and zeros in a 20-bit stream should be less than or equal to two. Otherwise, you start to build up uh, you know, charge uh, problems between the differential pair in the receiver end. Okay? And, that, uh, so there, and then, in practice, uh, that, uh, what we do is we, we enforce that there should be no more than five consecutive ones or zeros in any stream, just so that there's no chance they will build up that charge, you know, uh, uh, charge imbalance. So for example, if we look at trans uh, the transfer of all zeros, it's bad, because it has more than five zero bits in a row. Okay, so that would potentially cause this charge imbalance problem. And this is five zeros followed by three ones. That's also bad, because you have five zeros consecutive, five zeros consecutive. And uh, if you have zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, great. If you have zero, uh, one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, as long as there are no consecutive five ones or five zeros, it's good. It's a little bit more conservative than saying that there shouldn't be, uh, you know, the difference between zeros and ones should, uh, in a 20 bit stream should be less than, uh, or, uh, less than or equal to two because that is a harder measure to keep track of. But it's easier to keep track whether we have five consecutive ones or zeros. Okay, so implementation wise, this is a simpler implementation, but it gives you a little bit more conservative enforcement. So, but exactly how do we control this, right? We transfer data, so data was given to us, how, how can I eliminate zero, all zero transmissions, right? So the way to do this is by encoding, encoding uh, the byte. Each byte has 256 patterns, right? Each byte has 256 patterns. So whenever, whenever we need to encode 8-bit uh, byte, we actually encode it with 10 bits. Okay, we have a table that uh, map all the 256 patterns into a 10-bit pattern, okay, 10-bit you know, quantity. And the mapping only picks the good patterns in the 10-bit you know, space. So we only use the 10-bit patterns that do not have either more than five one bits or more than five zero bits consecutively. So you, we pick 256 good patterns out of the 100, uh, 1,024, and then we, whenever there's a byte coming in, we have a little table, we map the byte into, the, you know, into one of uh, the, 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 the bad pattern, into one of the good patterns, we transmit it, and on the other side, we take the 10-bit pattern and we, trend, we map it back to the 8-bit pattern. So that uh, we, we always can recover the, uh, the data without having any kind of um, you know, DC buildup. And this causes 20% overhead, right? Because in order to transfer any 8-bit bytes, we transfer 10 bits. And so two of the bits is always wasted. So that's why we can only utilize 80% of the channel, the, uh, the, uh, the channel uh, bit rate or channel bandwidth. So that's why in the PCIe 2, Gen 2 generation, they use this method. Okay? And that means that the, each lane has to operate at 5 gigabit per second in physical sense. And then you sacrifice 20%, you end up with 4 gigabit per second. So that was the four gigabit per second generation, okay? PCIe 3 uses scrambling. So it actually takes the eight, take, uh, takes the eight bits 
and then you will scramble. Uh, you know, it actually takes 155 bits and do the scrambling. So it, uh, it, it does enough of the reordering as it transfers that it, it practically eliminates all the, uh, you know, uh, the possibility of consecu five consecutive zeros or consecutive ones. So instead of using a mapping table, it actually used a piece of logic that you know, keeps track of all the, you know, a, a window of bits, and then it will just kind of you know, the, do some kind of scrambling to make sure that, uh, you know, to, to almost make sure that there's no five consecutive bits. And you use the reverse scrambling algorithm on the other side, and they are kind of, there's a agreed upon uh, way to you know, synchronize the two. But it's not perfect, so every 55 bits or so, you need to add one more, one more bit into the, uh, into the stream just to make sure that um, you, know, you, you, you don't have that consecutive uh, bit length. So, so this gives us 128 useful bytes. One, you introduce one overhead every 55 bits. So, uh, or every 65 bits. So that's why you know, it's uh, you know, 166 bits. Uh, so uh, when you, uh, you know, uh, do some uh, uh, calculation, you end up with 128 useful bits out of 130, because 65 times 2 is 130. So every 65 bits, you introduce one useless bit into the transmission just to guarantee it. So this gives us two bits wasted every 130. So they no longer implement a higher bandwidth, higher bit rate, raw circuit, and then sacrifice 20%. Now they implement a 8-bit raw bit rate, and then sacrifice just a little bit. So that's why you're going to measure just a little bit less than 8 gigabit per second link, you know, whenever you do a real benchmark on these machines. So, so uh, if we look at sort of the, the more recent PCIe uh, PC architecture, it looks like this. Um, the North Bridge and South Bridge are named his, for historical reasons. They are all now PCIe switches. Okay, they're all now just PCIe switches in the uh, in the system. So you have the the CPU here, and then uh, you know this is about. 10 years old, you know, maybe even 15 years old now. So the, uh, the Intel uh, chip here has something called the front side bus, and the front side bus and, uh, will go in the, uh, into the memory bus through the uh, north bridge, and then you have the PCIe link from the GPU that will go into the memory as well. And then you have this, uh, the PCIe switches that implement the south bridge, and each, each I.O. device has a PCIe link. Whenever the, uh, the I.O. device does not require very high bandwidth, you have like X1. Uh, the mouse, <laughs> they just have an X1 connector into the system. And if you have a hard drive, if you have a NIC network interface card, they will have X8, you know, the kind of bandwidth, or sometimes X16 even. PC, all the uh, GPUs have either X8 or X16 connection into the system because they need more bandwidth, okay? So, um, if you're interested in, uh, you know, in, the, uh, in, in this, uh, read John Stokes' PCI Express overview. And then, uh, you know, there's some uh, I.O. cards, PCIe I.O. cards are actually still old PCI cards. And they have a, they put a little bit adapter from PCI to PCIe, and then just, you know, sell these, these cards. These are very, very low-end I.O. cards that people probably designed 20 years ago. And they don't want to spend any money to, to redesign it. So they just buy an adapter chip and put that in front of the, the PCI you know, the interface and then just use that uh, to plug into a PCIe slot today. Yes? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does the, how does the yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'm going to come back to this point. Because that's why I said recent. It's not up to date. So, so this is a, uh, this is a, a very, very, very recent uh, consumer-level GPU card. Uh, 
the GTX is a Pascal level GPU. And uh, as you know, uh, Pascal is uh, the kind of the, uh, right now, the very new GPUs are both us, right? And uh, Pascal was the immediate previous generation. So, you know, there are the kind of the, the bulk of the consumer cards that you see uh, in, the, in the market. So the card has a 16X PCI Express. So you, you plug that into one of those PCIe slots in the back of your PC. And um, it, this is mostly a gamer's card. And then uh, you have the, you know, the G, uh, uh, memory. You have eight of these mem You have these eight of these uh, DRAM, you know, the uh, modules. And so uh, this, this is, uh, they all together give you eight gigabyte, 256 bit, uh, you know, GDDR uh, generation five. And uh, the memory clock is uh, 1.25 gigahertz, and then uh, the write clock is tw twice of that, to uh, 2.5 gigahertz. And um, you have a quad interface. Q means that the interface runs at four times the speed of the internal core, okay? So you have double rate DDR and have QDR interface. And so this gives you up to 10 gigabit per second per pin. Into, uh, in accessing these DRAMs. So we have a 256, remember that's 256? These are the, this is the width of your memory bus. Okay, so we can access 256 bits on the bus, and that bus is running at quad, four times of the 2.5 giga, uh, gigahertz. So this gives you a total of 320 gigabyte per second memory bandwidth. Okay, uh, 320 gigabyte per second memory bandwidth. And this is implemented as eight pieces of eight gigabit, you know, uh, 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 eight gigabit for each, from each of these, uh, you know, modules. So this is 16 megabit per, uh, you know, per chip, 32 chips per, uh, you know, per bank, and then 16 banks. Okay, so that's, remember I talk about these, you know, uh, DRAM channels. So there are eight DRAM channels in this thing, and then uh, you know, uh, each, one cons uh, co each one actually has 16 banks, okay, inside the channel. So if you go back to the, uh, the, the memory you know, uh, bandwidth lecture, you should go back and look at the sort of the, the more conceptual picture, and this should close the loop for you, okay. So this gives you about 320 gigabyte per second and, um, uh, but in terms of PCIe, the bandwidth is gonna be much, much lower. Remember we said in PCIe Gen 3, the per lane bandwidth is eight gigabit per second, each direction, right? So, um, and then uh, for X16, right, we have an X16 PCIe uh, connector, so you multiply that by 16, right? 16 is two times eight. So eight gives you the byte, right? Eight gives you the byte, and two gives you the additional multiplier. So we have 16 gigabyte per second transfer rate in each direction for this GPU to communicate with the CPU, right? So Pascal consumer card should have 16 gigabyte per second could the main copy hosted the device and 16 gigabyte per second copy bandwidth from device to host. Compared to the 320 gigabyte per second uh, memory bandwidth, we are quite, uh, quite a bit lower here, right? 16 gigabyte per second versus the 320 gigabyte per second, right? It's 120 is the bandwidth, uh, the, uh, the bandwidth. So that's why if you, if you act, if, if your data does not, if your computation does not have very significant reuse of data, when you transfer the data from CPU to GPU, you better be comp doing a lot of computation, a lot of reuse of that data, okay, during that computation. Even more than the tiling and so on within the GPU. Remember, we were talking about inside the GPU with the global memory, right? With the global memory, with the compute, 
we still need to be able to reuse that data about 40 times to get good performance. This is after the data already got placed under the GPU. If you want to place some data on the GPU from the CPU memory, you have only 5% of the bandwidth to, to do that compared to the memory bandwidth right, of the GPU. So the amount of reuse better be even more. This is the reason why for real applications, oftentimes people are directly placing, storing all that data on the GPU memory now without doing the uh, transfer. Because you know, that, that's really the, the main way for real applications to really benefit from the GPUs. For example, in machine learning, when you train, the data, uh, uh, train a neural net, all the ways are always placed on the GPU memory. They never really transfer back to the CPU. And then you just do the updates in the GPU memory because of this, because of this, this, this limitation. Does that make sense? OK. So this is going back to your question now. Uh, so in the, the real modern uh, you know, current machines, both Intel and uh, AMD chip, uh, CPU chips and IBM CPU chips now have what we call the, the private memory channels. Okay? And this trend started, I believe, uh, by, uh, was started by AMD. And uh, AMD used hypertransport, and then uh, they put the memory channel uh, to the back of the CPU. So essentially, if you look at a CPU, the CPU now incorporates a memory channel. So uh, it's no longer this picture. <laughs> Here, you see that there's a front side bus, and there's a north bridge, and this is the, the memory, right? This is the, uh, the DRAM. But in the, uh, in the uh, new chips, the memory is now actually on, on the CPU side, on the CPU side to the back. So the CPU has a memory, uh, memory controller here and then directly access the, the, the DRAM. And the DRAM is no longer on this side. Okay? And why? Because the CPUs need more memory bandwidth. There's no question about that. The, C the front side bus was operating at about 12 gigabyte per second for Intel chips for a long, long time. And then when they put the, the memory bus to the back, and then uh, you'll have the memory channel in the back, they started to have 40 gigabyte per second, you know, 60 gigabyte per second bandwidth out of this, uh, the CPUs, because now it's under the Intel control. They can put the me uh, memory controller. But this whole trend is actually started by the AMD CPUs. And uh, IBM CPUs, the power CPUs, do the same thing. So, if you look at the picture, what really happens is that the DRAM is actually to the back. The re reality is the DRAM should have been accessed by this, okay? So this is a conceptual picture. And so whenever the GPU needs to access data, the GPU actually now connects to a PCIe switch and then gets connected to the CPU, okay, to the CPU, a CPU has a little bit of a backdoor to, uh, of the memory controller to the DRAM. So the accesses will go from GPU, PCIe switch, into the CPU con memory controller, and then go into the main memory. Okay, so that's the, that's the, uh, the, the memory access path for, C uh, for system DRAM for the GPUs today. Okay? So the DMA is really the main device for data transfer between the CPU and GPU. We don't use software transfer. We actually use the direct memory access um, you know, to copy a, you know, a, a, a chunk of data between, uh, from the host to device or from the device to host. And uh, you already learned the DMA device in the, you know, the 391, and hopefully. So uh, you know, it's, it's just a, a very simple piece of logic that has a, a counter that uh, tell, you, know, you have a base address and you have a counter, and then that device just repeatedly copy data through the, uh, through the interconnect uh, you know, from, the, uh, you know, from the GPU global memory into the main memory or from the main memory into the GPU global memory. Okay? And that, the, the counter is set by the CUDA main copy because the CUDA main copy gives you the number of bytes. Right? It specifies the number of bytes being, being transferred. So, so the, you know, and then you also need to have 
the pointer to the source and point it to the device. And those are the base registers, OK? So each call to, these, to the CUDA main copy uh, you know, initializes the DMA, and then you know, it will just do the transfer. And the uh, DMA uses physical addresses for source and destination. So whenever the, uh, you know, the CUDA driver receives a CUDA main copy, it takes the pointer values, translate that into physical addresses, and then uh, uh, sets up the DMA. Okay. So th any question about that? Okay. Now let's go into the programmer side. Okay. This thing requires pin memory for this reason. This, we ask this question in the uh, second exam all the time. So the DMA uses the physical addresses. Okay. So the driver, remember the driver you know, uh, uses virtual address, and then uh, it gets translated into physical address, and then uh, it would uh, you know, be used to, act, uh, to initialize the DMA. So during the transfer, right? So the driver did that trans uh, translation and set up the, the, uh, the DMA, and then, OK, so, so it's ongoing. And it takes a little bit of time. Right? It takes a little bit of time for the data to go over. Now, during this time, the operating system, this is a multi-programming environment, right? So the operating system could be serving page faults for other processes. Okay? And the operating system says, I need some physical memory for this other process. So I'm going to replace one of the pages. Okay, I'm going to uh, you know, the, the take one of the pages and then give to that other process. The operating system could accidentally take the page that is currently being involved in that transfer, right? the host, host page. Okay? And when that happens, let's say you have a CUDA main copy, and you're copying data from the host memory to the device memory. And then the operating system pull the plug underneath you and say, you know, I'm going to take, give this page to the other process. And that other process is going to initialize it and then uh, do some, something to the page. So by the time you receive all the data in your application on the GPU, you're receiving the clobbered, you know, uh, 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 polluted data by the other process. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that, that situation, right? And uh, by the way, the DMA uh, usually knows the page boundaries and so on, so they, they, they do the adjustments. So the pin memory, so this means that whenever you, you're getting a DMA to do a transfer, any page being you know, used or written to by the DMA in the system main memory, in the system physical memory, needs to be locked down. It needs to say, these pages are being involved in a DMA kind of activity. The operating system should not take any of these pages and give it to other processes. So this is called page lock memory or pin memory. Any questions about that? You can actually go into any of these pages in the, in the system, set a bit in, that, uh, in the page table, and make that page into a pin page. And we call it a pay, pin page or pin memory. Okay? So pin memory cannot be paged out. So if a source or destination of a CUDA main copy in the host memory is not in the pin memory, then it needs to be first copy into the pin, uh, pin memory before you use the DMA. So this is an extra copy that you don't know about, okay, as a programmer. You give a, you know, sort of a CPU, a host data structure, and say, I want to copy that data into the device. And by default, the memory locations are not going to be pinned, not going to be paid, uh, you know, the, uh, locked down. So the host, the, the driver, for that CUDA main copy will first take your user data structure and copy it into a pin buffer first. So it's one memory copy first, inside the main memory, do the copy. And then you would use the pin buffer to copy to the GPU memory, and that's the real copy. 
So if you measure your CUDA main copy performance, it's roughly half of what you expect. Okay, this is the, the second half, because the first half oftentimes comes from the advertisement, right? The, the PCIe only can do half of the bandwidth in each direction that they usually advertise. But now you have another half, which is because they did a copy, you know, uh, first do a uh, you know, uh, under the hood copy because you need to use a pin memory for your GPU, for your uh, real DMA access. So that's why a lot of times when applications really want to transfer data fast, the application will manage the host data structure as pinned data structure. Okay, they would actually just you know allocate the uh, you know some of these you know the data structures that they know they need to transfer to the GPU as pinned uh, you know data structure, and you can allocate pinned data structures through this CUDA host alloc. Remember. When we taught, first taught the CUDA memory, we say CUDA malloc, right? CUDA malloc would just give you vanilla non-pinned memory. But if you use CUDA host alloc for your data structures, then you will be, you know, all these pages will be marked as pinned. And the CUDA driver will be able to tell that these data structures are pinned, and therefore they don't need to do the extra copy and suddenly your CUDA main copy will run, you know, at the full speed, okay? So the CUDA host alloc takes three parameters, address of the pointer to the allocated memory, and size of the allocated memory, and there's option that, uh, you know, the CUDA host alloc default, and most programmers just use the default parameters, and unless you have some really, really tricky things you want to do for RDMA kind of things, and then you go in and, okay, so if that term doesn't sound familiar to you, then, Use default, okay, just use default, right? Okay, and then CUDA free host is the memory free. So if you allocate pin memory, and when you free the memory, you, the, uh, the CUDA, uh, the, uh, the memory free function needs to reset the pin so that that, uh, that page goes back to the pageable pool for the operating system. If you don't free these things properly, bad things happen, okay? And pinned memory essentially is a, is a resource taken away from the operating system. If more and more and more pages are pinned, then the operating system page, you know, the uh, virtual memory uh, manager will have fewer and fewer pages available for you know, giving out to the processes. At some point, you will get a blue screen saying that the system is out of memory, okay, because they're all pinned. So then, uh, even though there's nothing really wrong with the hardware, you'll have a blue screen, the system will crash, and then you'll say, oh, um, you know, my system, uh, my hardware failed. The hardware did not fail. It's because the pin memory got, you know, didn't get free properly, and then uh, so eventually you, you went out of memory. So, uh, when we use the pin memory, uh, we, you know, uh, and uh, we use the, uh, the kind of the pin allocated memory and pointer the, exactly the way uh, the same way as malloc. Okay, so as far as the rest of the application is concerned, if a data structure is uh, allocated as pin or not pin, doesn't matter. Okay, the data can be used in exactly the same way. The only difference is, uh, you know, you, these pages cannot be, uh, you know, paged by the operating system, and the CUDA main copy can, you know, should run about twice as fast. And pin memory is a limited resource whose oversubscription can have serious consequences, as I've already explained. So CUDA is not the only system that requires pin memory. Pin memory is a known trick, and all the NIC providers, and uh, Nalanox, and uh, you know, MPI you know, uh, uh, systems that use these you know, uh, um, cluster level uh, network, they all use pin memory because they all know if you need to do transfer a piece of data from the CPU to the network interface, from the network interface to the CPU, if you want to have the full bandwidth, you need to use pin memory, right? So, so everyone knows. So that's why, you know, when you go into a, a server today, you will have a whole bunch of things all trying to use pin memory, 
So you know what? It's not just the CUDA system that uses thin memory. If you're not careful, the memory will pretty quickly, you know, will be all used up as pin memory, and then uh, you know, your your server can get into trouble. In the early days, when you use MPI and CUDA on the same system, they do not have common pin memory pools. So that means that you cannot pin, you know, use the same pin memory. Let's say if you copy a piece of data from the MPI device from the network interface to the memory system, and then you want to copy it to the, G, uh, the GPU. Because they don't use the same pools, you actually need to copy into the main memory into a pin memory, and then you copy from the MPI pin memory to the CUDA pin memory, and then you copy from the CUDA pin memory to the GPU. Okay, and that took a while to resolve. So, so this is these are the kind of things that you know um, when you Work, you know, work on these high-performance systems. You know, these are the kind of things that you have. You, you will be extremely confusing unless you actually have studied some of these base, you know, foundational concepts and really understand what these things mean. Okay, questions? Any questions? Okay, good. So, we talk about some important trends. Okay, and um, uh, so we we. We studied the ancient PC architecture, and many of you have no clue how the, uh, the old PCs work. And all of you know about Bill Gates, all of you know about his foundation and so on, but very few of you know exactly how he made money. Okay? And he made money by writing an operating system that can fit into 48K bytes of RAM using the exact Northbridge and Southbridge architecture that we talk, <laughs> I was talking about. So, so that's how you know he started Microsoft, and then you know got into the uh, the dominating uh, software position. And um, so we talk, we look at the kind of the front side bus kind of architecture, preserving mostly the original architecture, but switching the North Bridge and South Bridge into the uh, PCIe switches, right? And then we talk about the current architecture, where uh, you know the CPUs now have the DRAM controller separate from the system bus, and everyone who wants to access the system memory has to go through the CPU chip, and this is what uh, you know, the was previous mentioned. Uh, you know, the CPU now has the memory controller, essentially that north bridge. Okay, the north bridge is now part of the CPU, and that north bridge you know, needs to be accessed by any other device, including the GPUs and so on, first onto the CPU, and then go into the memory, okay? So that's where we are today. And the CPUs and GPUs are, you know, also being fused together t today. You have more and more of the fus fusion chips today, in the, especially in the embedded world. Uh, most of the SOCs in the, in, the, um, in the cell phone world now have CPU and GPU fused together in the same package. In some cases, even the same chip. The Qualcomm chips and so on have that kind of you know, arrangement. And the outsourcing of these computations is becoming easier and easier. So any questions before I go into the programmers, uh, you know, sort of the CUDA programming level of data transfers? Any questions? Okay, good. So we're going to kind of move ahead a little bit. Remember, uh, I'm, you know, we're trying to create some room for that new half lecture. So this will give us a good position. So now, now you understand the hardware. Okay, so, so you know, we, we spend a lecture on, you know, a whole, almost a whole lecture on how that hardware, you know, really works and uh, what, you know, bandwidth means and what lanes mean you know, when you have these links, you know what, the, why do we call them X links? You know, X1, X2, X4, X8, and so on. And for the purpose of GPUs, almost all the GPU links to the CPU are X16 links, okay? And um, so, so you, you know, that, that, that kind of simplifies things a little bit. And then uh, we, we understand the pin memory, right? So, so now you understand, you know, uh, you, uh, the design important decision about whether you want to use pin memory for the data structure 
when the data instruction needs to be you know, copied to the, to the GP, uh, C, uh, GPU. So remember, the pinned memory is always on the host side. It only, it's only relevant on the host side because the host is going to be paging in and out on the host memory, right? The GPU memory is not being managed by the host virtual memory management. It's only managed by the uh, CUDA driver and the CUDA virtual memory management. So the, uh, the host operating system will not page in these things in and out. The, so now let's go into the data transfer um, from the CUDA programmer's point of view and then the CUDA streams. And so we use this opportunity to introduce the concept of task parallelism. Okay, the task parallelism, um, you know, which is an important, uh, uh, important type of parallelism that we have not really talked about in the course so far. So the objective is to learn more advanced features of CUDA APIs for data transfer and a good, a kernel launch. So we will use task parallelism for overlapping data transfer with kernel computation. In a lot of the uh, applications, we want to make sure that uh, we don't spend a lot of overhead uh, transferring data by hiding the data transfer latency. So if we can overlap the, comp the, the data transfer latency with the kernel execution uh, time, then we can transfer that data for free, right? So a lot of the applications try to accomplish this, but the mechanism for uh, you know, achieving this kind of hiding, uh, you know, late data transfer latency hiding is through the task parallelism um, that we can achieve with CUDA streams. So let's kind of take a step back and look at the execution of our uh, kind of MP uh, you know, the MP kernels. So far, if we look at, let's say, something like a vec vector addition, okay, the execution timing is quite serialized. We transfer uh, A, you know, the, uh, uh, the A vector to, uh, you know, to, uh, to the uh, GPU, and then we transfer the B vector to the GPU, and then we do a vector addition, and then we transfer the output C back to the host. The execution of these things are going to be serialized. So when we transfer A and B, we have these two CUDA uh, main copies, right? And these two CUDA main copies are going to be using the downlink from the CPU, uh, from the host to the GPU, downlink, right? And that link can only you know, accommodate one transfer each time. So these two are going to be serialized. And then during this time, during all this time, we only use one direction of the PCIe. Remember, the PCIe is a bidirectional uh, interconnect. So you should be able to do one transfer down and one transfer up. But when we program this way, we only will be using the downlink in that first part of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, part of the time. And then we launch the kernel. Right? We launch the kernel, and the kernel you know, will execute. During the execution of that kernel, nothing happens on the PCIe, neither up or downstream. Okay? So the PCIe is completely you know, idle. And then after the execution of the kernel, when we transfer C back, we only use one direction of the PCIe, which is the uplink from the uh, GPU to CPU. So in each case, we have three major resources, right? We, if you think about you know, the hardware, we have the PCIe downlink resource, we have the PCIe uplink resource, and we have the GPU execution resource. We only use one third of these resources any point in time, right? So that's, you know, obviously that's not the most efficient way of using resources. And so the total execution time is going to be the sum of all these four activities. Started about uh, you know, uh, the second generation um, of CUDA. So it's long past. That's why we used to say some CUDA devices support device overlap. Now, I officially changed the, the slide from last year to this year, say most CUDA devices, because 
if you look out uh, you know, in the kind of the, all the GPUs in use today, indeed the majority of the GPU, uh, CUDA GPU devices support device overlap now. So I just changed the word to most. So um, this means that we can simultaneously execute a kernel while performing a data between the device and host memory. So when we execute that vector kernel, okay, when we execute that vec uh, vector addition kernel, the downlink and uplink can actually operate. Okay, they, they can still they, they can operate exactly overlapping and then in parallel with the uh, with the GPU execution, because the DMAs are designed to be uh, you know smart enough that the, the GPU the rest of the GPU doesn't have to pay attention to that. Okay, so so you can actually if you're not sure. You can do a device query, and then uh, after the device query, so this is the, the query that you learn to use in your MP0. After that device query, take the, uh, the, prop, uh, the property return value and check the field device overlap. If it's one, it means that the overlap can, can work. If it's zero, it means that it's too primitive a GPU that uh, you cannot have device overlap. The only GPUs that cannot have device overlap today are the little puny GPUs that sometimes you get for free on some of your PCs and that, that are produced by NVIDIA. And then uh, you know, those puny GPUs don't have device overlap. You know, most of, you know, so that's why uh, almost all the new de uh, device drivers and the most of the CUDA devices out there can use device overlap. So in order to to do the uh, uh, device, you know, to take advantage of this, we're, no, we're not going to, for vector addition, we're not going to take the entire vector and send it to the GPU, do the addition, and send the result back. We're going to chop up the vector. Okay, we're going to chop up the vector into sections. Okay, into sections. And we call them, uh, you know, A.1, A.2, A.3. These are section 1, section 2, section 3 of the vector. And this is only used when you have very, very big vectors, right? So, you know, so we chop, it, chop them up into A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, C3. So, during, uh, so we're going to do an iterative approach. We take the first chunk, okay, we'll, we'll take the first chunk of A and first chunk of B, transfer it into the GPU. And then we do a compute. We compute. A1 plus B1, and we generate that C1, and then we transfer C, the, the section, the first section of the result, C1, back to the, uh, to the CPU. Now, as soon as we finish the transfer of A1, B1, we, go, we begin to transfer A2, B2. So this is different, right? This is different uh, 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 data transfer pattern. We used to transfer the entire A, so we'll have A1, A2, A3, and all in that same same chunk of transfer, we transfer the entire A, and then we transfer the entire B, right? But here, we have a little, we transfer a small section of A, small section of B, and then we do that compute right away. We, we start to do the compute right away. And then we eventually transfer that C1 back. So the second one, we do the same thing. And did you notice that uh, during the, the second time period, now I'm using 2 thirds of the resources. I'm using the GPU execution resource and the downlink resource now, okay? And then the third, during the third time period, I'm using all the three resources. I'm using the uplink resource to, come, uh, to transfer C.1 back to the CPU. I'm processing, computing the A2B2 into C2, and also I'm using, I'm transferring the A3, B3 downlink to the GPU. So this gives me a full utilization of the system resource. And for the next time period, I have exactly the same thing, but shifted to the next sections, right? And if I have a very, very long vector, I will have many, many of these little sections, right? And then I'll have a very long period of time where the system resource is fully utilized. And then I'll have a little bit of uh, ramp down at the end. For those of you who are taking 411, you should recognize this picture. This is exactly a three-stage pipeline picture. 
right, of the instruction pipeline. There's nothing new under the sun, okay? There are, all, there are only a few, very small number of concepts. So this is the pipeline processing of sections, okay, of sections of data. So next time, um, on Thursday, when I come back, I'm going to talk about exactly what the CUDA mechanisms you need to use and what are the real semantics of that in order for you to control this kind of pipeline. Okay? So I'll uh, see you on Thursday. Thank <laughs> you.